Everybody get a cap? Take a moment to thank you. Welcome the Amanita Muscaria mushroom into your life. Find a comfortable seat and I would like to Thank you. Just find a comfortable seat. You can lay down whatever feels right to you and your body in this moment. I'm just going to be tuning in to what it is that we need to nourish our beings. In a lot of ways, that's what Amanita helps us see. Like many other psychedelics, tap us into the world, other people, community, maybe other life forms. And many people would say Amanita Muscaria is just about tapping into you, your story, and your life. Just take a moment, sit with the cap. If anybody just came up, welcome to come up and grab a mushroom cap. Let's go ahead and close our eyes and find a comfortable seat or laying down. We're going to do a little guided meditation journey. Just imagine you're walking through the woods, walking through a beautiful forest, old growth, pine trees. soft beneath your feet, filtered light tickles your eyes as you walk through, seeing the sun through the filtered canopy. A lot of little bugs, wildlife, as you're walking through this trail, begin to notice some fungal activity. Maybe you see this bright red mushroom coming out to you. Calling out to you. saying, hey, I'm here. I'm that mushroom you're looking for. I'm bright red with a bunch of little white eyes. And I'm looking at you, and I see you looking at me. So what's up? <laughs> this next part is going to be very individual. to pick this mushroom. It was almost like it was speaking to you directly to your soul. <clears throat> and maybe maybe this mushroom has a message for you. Whatever the first thing that comes to your mind. That's something that you might want to reflect on. You thank the mushroom 
put it in your bag, and start your journey back home. <laughs> Having left the forest with the feeling of gathering more than just a mushroom, but some jewel, some lesson within yourself that was already there. It's just the mushroom showed you. That's what Amanita is about. For anybody who's just came in, um, if you'd like to hold an Amanita mushroom, we have some up here. Anybody else? Thank you guys. That concludes our our getting to know Amanita. So let's let's talk about Amanita. Um, how many are familiar with Amanita? Show of hands. Amanita muscaria specifically. All right, quite a lot. Um, if you guys want to come in closer, you're welcome to. If you want some coverage, let's get let's get cozy. Uh, how many people have actually ingested Amanita muscaria? Show of hands. All right. Go one, two, maybe three, four. Okay. Five. All right. Cool. Maybe some of you just nibbled it for the first time. It's all right. It's almost like. So, Amanita muscaria is, in a lot of ways, one of the oldest uh, psychedelic mushrooms, but a lot of people wouldn't call it psychedelic. And that just depends on what you would call psychedelic, I think. When people think of psychedelics, they think about psilocybin or LSD or salvia or something like that. A lot of these are the serotonin pathways, they're, they're affecting the serotonin pathways. Whereas Amanita muscaria's main compound, muscimol, is a GABA-A agonist. So just to give you an idea, like the genre of effects you're looking at, um, some other GABA agonists are alcohol, benzodiazepine, uh, chamomile, lavender, uh, kava kava. So it's gonna be more of that sedative, relaxing, um, anxiolytic, reducing anxiety effects. Um, so this talk is going to be limited. I only have like less than an hour. I'm not going to be able to cover everything. But I'm going to do. You can go to. You can keep your hour. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, but even with that, I mean, I could talk about Amanita all day and not cover everything. It's there's such a rich history with Amanita muscaria, and. Uh, there's a lot of mythology, there's a lot of lore. Um, yeah, you know, it's the mushroom emoji. Is that better? It's a little bit better. Can you, better? Uh, can you guys see that at all? It's better with better the sheet or not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. This is the Super Mario mushroom. It's in Alice in Wonderland. Um, it's in pop culture everywhere. You know, Katy Perry. Uh, new ridiculous <laughs> music video and um, it's all throughout children's stories uh, the original story of Hansel and Gretel uh, the book spill the lucky mushroom um, and also with the Santa Claus mythology so that's that's an interesting thing I'll get into in a little bit but um, there's a lot of mythology there's a lot of uh, lore behind this ancient magic mushroom so, you know, what is it really all about? And, you know, I think, you know, if you guys are familiar with the term occult, occult is magic that's like hidden in plain sight. So we have this bright red mushroom that grows on every continent on the earth. And nobody really knows 
a whole lot about it. I'm not talking about you guys, this is MycoFest, but <laughs> most people, if you look in a field guide, you're gonna see Amanita muscaria listed as a toxic mushroom. Like, don't touch it, it's poisonous. Um, whereas there have been indigenous cultures that have been using this for thousands of years. Uh, but before I get into that, I just wanted to talk about my personal journey with Amanita muscaria to give you guys some context of where I'm coming from. Um, for most of my life, I had a very long, um, bad relationship with cannabis. And it, it was, I'd say mostly my fault. You know, I have an addictive mindset. Um, I would just smoke weed all day, every day. And it was giving me anxiety and paranoia. And I wasn't listening to my body, which is telling me to stop. But um, I was listening to my mind that constantly wanted that fixation. And uh, a couple of years ago, it came to a point where um, there was just one event where I knew, like, I have to stop. Like, I can't do this anymore. And uh, it was actually the same night somebody said, hey, have you ever heard of microdosing Amanita muscaria? And I was like, what? That's that poisonous mushroom. Like, why would I eat that? Why would I microdose it? And then over the next couple months, um, Two other people had said they had taken Amanita muscaria at higher doses, like 15 grams. And I said, well, okay, you're not dead. Like, what happened? You know? And I said, well, not much happened during the experience. I kind of felt like I was floating. Um, you know, time was uh, distorted. But it's been two weeks since I took it, and I have this profound, like, lingering sense of peace. And I don't really know why. And I was like, okay, there's something to this. And I had been weaning myself off of cannabis at that time. Um, and I, I bought some caps. I made um, a microdose tea. I was freezing the, the tea into little ice cubes, little microdose cubes I would eat every day. And I found that I was getting a lot of the, the benefits from cannabis that most people enjoy. Uh, but I didn't have the negative side effects like anxiety, paranoia, uh, dependency, um, and like, to anybody who smokes cannabis, it's amazing medicine. I'm not dissing it at all. There's just, there's a medicine for everybody. And I think Amanita is coming in to a time where we need to be healing from trauma. And some people have so much anxiety, they can't even microdose psilocybin, they can't, you know, microdose cannabis. Um, this mushroom is way different, uh, being a GABA agonist. It's literally just suppressing the fight or flight response in the body. So uh, ever since then, uh, I've had a, a business in making mushroom extracts and herbal extracts since 2016. I started working with Amanita muscaria personally, and then I started offering it in my business. And because of that, I was able to quit my, my main job being a contractor and fully devoted my life to this mushroom. And I haven't really looked back since. And my personal life is flourishing too because I don't have this um, dependency issue. Uh, so that's how it has healed my life. Um, so I'm just gonna gloss over some of the historical use of mythology because there is a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of contradictory information. Um, but it is important to note. Uh, so you can see uh, Soma. Okay, Soma is from the Rig Veda, which is a very ancient um, Ayurvedic Hindu text. And Soma was speculated to be possibly a herbal or mushroom brew. Um, it could have been like a technology or a vehicle, something to connect with God and like be immortal. Um, Gordon Wasson wrote a book called Soma, the Divine Mushroom of Immortality, because he believed that it was Amanita muscaria. Um, and I don't know all the details on this, but basically the, the translation was that there were three filters with Soma. Uh, and with Amanita muscaria, to prepare it properly, you have to decarboxylate it. Um, there's a number of ways to do this. One of the ways would be to ferment it with uh, lactobacillus. So the idea was in India, where they have um, raw milk, uh, they make yogurt out of it, um, there's a live lactobacillus culture in there. 
And so there was this idea that um, they would be filtering it through these steps to make it safe to consume. Um, there's a lot of speculation. Some people think it's psilocybin. Um, some people think it's ergot. Uh, some people think it's like an alien technology. Uh, but it's it's curious, you know. Um, another theory is that uh, the the uh, Viking berserkers had taken uh, Amanita muscaria brew before they'd go into battle and get into these um, basically like a drunken rage and go off into battle and fight for hours and hours and hours and sometimes even like killing their own you know people so everybody would stay away from the berserkers and I've taken a lot of Amanita muscaria in basically every preparation you could imagine and I think that if you were taking Amanita muscaria in this fashion you'd probably be eating a raw mushroom um, because the ibotenic acid is very um, I'll get into the chemistry in a little bit but you have two main compounds ibotenic acid and muscimol ibotenic acid is um, uh, stimulates glutamate in the body it's very neuro excitatory um, you could probably go off into war but muscimol which is more of the yin more of the feminine side is more about relaxation and sleep and like healing trauma so i think you know if you're about to go off into battle you probably would take a nap instead um so you know there, there's some theories that it might have been you know uh, amanita maybe psilocybin but it might have been also something like datura which could put you into a, a frenzy for days on end um or henbane um, so, and then uh, the last couple pictures, uh, getting into the Celtic mythology, um, you know, and this is, this is where it gets really gray and fuzzy because, for one, the Celts didn't have a written language until like the last like 500 years of their reign. Um, they actually originated in the south uh, near Italy and France and, and middle uh, <laughs> South Europe. Uh, whereas we think of Celts in the British Isles and Ireland and Scotland, but that's really where uh, Rome, uh, the Rome, Roman Empire chased them off to. It was kind of like their last stronghold. But they didn't have a written language for the last, you know, until like the last 500 years of their reign. And also too with Roman Catholicism uh, essentially wiping out history and creating their new version of history a lot of these ancient practices have been wiped out. We don't really know what happened. I mean, they burned the Library of Alexandria, which was full of the ancient knowledge from Egypt, and um, they probably wiped out some things about the Celts. But you do see interesting um, kind of uh, hints at possibly them using Amanita muscaria. Like, there's the red speckled salmon in a lot of these stories. Um, you know, red salmon with, with speckles on it, kind of like an Amanita muscaria cap. And it's not like they're just fishing. Like this is a salmon that is like bringing them immortal life and like connecting them to the spirit realm. Uh, you know, so there, there's some, uh, there's an excerpt in uh, Kevin Feeney's book, Flyger Compendium, about the Celts um, and then Brigid Brigid is the patron, patron saint of, uh, which is this woman right here, uh, the patron saint of Ireland. But before that, she was a Celtic deity. And like a lot of things with Christianity, it's actually paganism reversed and, you know, revamped. So, um, you know, with the red hair, uh, there was some, you know, postulation that it might be referencing Amanita Muscaria. Um, you know, these, these things are kind of a, a stretch, in my opinion. Um, and then the, the magician card, uh, there was something in that about with, uh, you know, the, the infinity loop around the head being kind of looking like a mushroom and red and white robes um, connecting to the divine with the scepter. So, and then we get into some interesting things where we actually do have more historical evidence of this. So, um, the Siberian shamans uh, of the uh, Kamchatka Peninsula, I believe it's called. Um, they have used, they have a long history of using Amanita muscaria to connect with uh, the spirit realms. Um, we also get into the Sami people, which are still 
alive today. They don't really practice with Amanita muscaria today. Um, the, they, they kind of talk about it like, yeah, our ancestors used to do that, but um, they, uh, they have a long history of herding reindeer, or as I heard from a Sami person, they, they follow the reindeer. So the, the reindeer are kind of free range, and the Sami are nomadic people that kind of follow the, uh, the, the reindeer, the caribou. And the interesting thing is that caribou actually love to eat this mushroom. Um, and this is in uh, northern Finland. So that's basically like as close to the North Pole as you can get, right? So I'm getting closer to the Santa Claus mythology, as you can see. And there's, they also had um, shamans who would come around uh, at the end of the year during the winter solstice, uh, allegedly passing out these Amanita caps, uh, you know, maybe having a big sack on their back, carrying around red and white gifts. Hmm, all right, this is getting closer. And what trees are associated with Amanita? They're mycorrhizal. We all know what mycorrhizals are, right? They're mushrooms that are associated with the tree. They, they have a symbiotic relationship with the tree. And they are associated with the pine tree. And what do we do at Christmas? We have a pine tree with red and white gifts. Um, there's also the theory that these shamans would come in through the chimney, the smoke hole, uh, because the doors were uh, covered with snow. So, you know, we're getting really close to this, this uh, Santa Claus mythology. But, you know, the one interesting thing is that in all these depictions of these shamans, um, they, they were not wearing red and white. You know, that's more of like a Coca-Cola thing um, in the early 1900s. And so it's like, as much as I want it to be true, I'm not sure. And I don't think we can accurately depict it, but it is really interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, this slide on the right, I, I don't know where I even found this, but it's a, it's a caribou peeing, uh, a little red and white gift. And there's, there's a lot of theories about like, urine drinking, uh, urine recycling, uh, especially, especially with Amanita muscaria. Um, it is uh, partially decarboxylated in the gut. So these caribou would drink, or would eat the Amanitas, and there's definitely some pee drinking going on. We don't really know. It's, you know, it's not like, there's no scientific studies on like who's drinking the pee and like what level of decarboxylation is occurring. <laughs> but there's definitely some piss drinking going on. And so the theory was that the caribou would eat the Amanitas. They wouldn't be negatively affected as bad about, uh, with the ibotenic acid. And this is where the, you know, the flying reindeer theory comes in. Um, and then the people maybe, maybe collected their urine and drank that. Um, we don't really know, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll leave that up to, to science, maybe. Does anybody have any questions thus far? I'm gonna try to leave time for a couple questions after each section. You know, I'm kind of zooming along. See the uh, emanated by the the uh, stalls over there. I did not. Yeah, by, by, by the old yeah. but the, like the two quarter party is right over there. Okay. There's, there's a sign. By it, Does it say something about like pee? Or? <laughs> no, no, oh yeah, no. I just thought because it was by the porta potty. <laughs> no. Like it's supposed to be a gallery. Recycling your <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'll check it out. Does anybody else have uh, any questions thus far on anything I've talked about? We're gonna leave time for a little Q and A at the end if, if we have it. So, um, so now uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the chemistry and effects. So, Amanita muscaria contains a lot of different compounds, um, but the two ones I'm gonna talk about today is ibotenic acid and muscamol. So, ibotenic acid is a um, neurotr it stimulates glutamate. It actually acts very similarly to glutamate in the brain, so it stimulates the glutamate response. Um, the effects you can experience from ingesting a raw mushroom or a not fully decarbed Amanita muscaria mushroom is uh, having um, energizing, speedy, euphoria, even pot potentially anxious effects. Um, it can cause really negative side effects like tremors, seizures, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, salivating. Um, 
This is in typically higher doses when you're just eating like plain raw Amanita muscaria mushrooms. Um, it does have a potential for neurotoxicity. Um, it is used in, uh, in uh, lab rat tests to brain lesion, uh, to lesion brain cells. And they, they inter, intracranially uh, inject it to actually study uh, different parts of the brain. It actually makes it very easy for them to study. But there's no conclusive evidence on ingesting Amanita muscaria as a human, orally. Uh, and the, the side effects for neurotoxicity. Um, ibotenic acid, acid actually does not cross the blood brain barrier. So there, the jury is still out on that. But I will warn you guys, there is uh, a, a group of people who like to eat raw amanitas all the time and they swear by it and it's kind of a little culty and they're all a little goofy. So I don't know, there might be some brain lesioning going on. <laughs> Just, I do not recommend eating a raw amanita mushroom. I've done it. It's very uh, wild experience, but not not that fun. So that's ibotenic acid. And next, we'll talk about muscimol. Oh, go ahead. So what have you done to these? These are not decarbed fully, um, but I'll I'll get into basically when you dehydrate them, you're partially decarbing it. It's just like cannabis, how like you can change the pH. Um, you adjust it through temperature, um, dehydration. These processes are getting you closer to the decarboxylation. Um, most people that are really, really into Amanita, like they make the tea, they take the caps, they do that, you know, kind of, they pick them themselves. A lot of them aren't so concerned about like a full decarb. Like I've had a partial decarb, I've had full decarb, I've had no decarb, and like I kind of like in the middle or like muscimol like fully decarbed um everybody has their own preference though so and we'll, we'll talk about the de dehydration a little bit that was a good question though um so muscimol actually is what ibotenic acid decarboxylates into it loses a carboxyl group it's just like uh cannabis how you can make um uh you know weed butter uh you can't eat a bud but you can uh decarboxylate the cannabis and make it into a fat or a, a tincture with alcohol to extract those compounds to make it orally active. Uh, so muscimol is also psychoactive, uh, but it's more like the yin to the yang. Like yang is like the ibotenic acid. It's more aggressive. It's more speedy, energizing, like get shit done. Muscimol is more about going inward. It's more about going inside and healing deep, deep trauma. Um, some, some people would say that uh, higher doses of muscimol and amanita touch places that other psychedelics can't get to, which is typically like your, your subconscious programming from age six and younger, where we have and store a lot of our programming and our trauma from childhood. Uh, muscimol is anxiolytic, so uh, anything that's a GABA A agonist is going to help you reduce uh, anxiety, it's going to help um, suppress or uh, limit the fight or flight response in the body. So you can get more into that rest and digest. Um, it helps with insomnia, people who have issues around sleep. Um, I know many people who can only sleep for a couple hours at a time. They'll take Amanita, microdose it, and they'll, they'll uh, sleep for six to eight hours.